Friends, as we trickle in, please grab your seats here. Why don't we begin this morning reversing our order normally carried out and turn to Trinity Psalter Hymnal 243. I think a good singing will be a good beginning for us. 243, all six verses of uh, how firm a foundation. Let's all rise together, shall we? Well, welcome to our 2024 version of the Robert G. Dendalk and Nellie B. Dendalk Lectures on Pastoral Ministry. Many of you may not remember uh, Robert and Nellie. Robert is with the Lord now, but he's our second Bob. That is, he's our second president of this institution. One of the words that he penned when he was talking about his goal as the leader of this institution, where he served not only five years as the president, but also many years as the chairman of the board, and even before that, as someone who led our development team for many years. Not only he himself leading the team, but his wife, Nellie, intimately related and involved in cheerleading the institution. In his inaugural address, he summarized the task of our institution this way when he said, our task must be to be men of academic excellence who have been with Jesus, 
who can reach out and speak to the philosophies and religions of our age, as well as to the common man, and both by message and by our lives. Highlights to not only men of Jesus and women of Jesus, but also not only that, exalting the name of Jesus, not only with our message proclaimed, but our lives lived out well. That's our goal here, to train our students, both men and women, to be experts in the Bible who exalt the name of Christ Jesus on high. And we do that in a community as we have here, not simply because we like being together nearby. And there is some truth to that. There is much learning that takes place outside of the classroom as much as inside the classroom. But we are on this journey together, encouraging one another in our service to the church and to the work of Christ Jesus himself. As we do that, one of the ways that we remember and honor faithful workers like the Dendulks, and one of the ways that we encourage our community that's on campus here is to bring seasoned speakers each year to teach us and share with us about their lives as well as their ministry. And this year, we have the honor of also welcoming one of the seasoned pastors in our local areas to come and teach us. In particular, the topic he's addressing is Semper Reformanda plus ministry, that is, to think about how church is always reforming, especially as he demonstrates how doc doctrines taught in scripture and summarized faithfully in our confessional documents should be applied to our piety and our practice, not only giving us courage, but also conviction about where we go and what we actually do. Our speaker for this morning and this week has been Pastor Chad Vegas, who is the founding pastor of Sovereign Grace Church in Bakersfield. If you don't know where Bakersfield is, you should look it up. It's one of those fast-growing areas where we need a lot of workers, and I only add that because my sister's family lives there too. Uh, and here, we come to recognize not only big cities, but mid-sized cities and rural areas all need the gospel of Christ Jesus. And we hope that many of you will prayerfully consider how the Lord is leading you in that direction. He received his MA in theology at Talbot School of Theology. He is the founding board member and continuing leader in Radius International, as well as he continues to work within the community at pl places like Providence Classical Academy. He has been married to Teresa since 1994. That's quite a long time. And Teresa's here with us, joining us this week, and have two children and one grandson. Now, as I have him come up and speak to us this morning on a topic, the commitments necessary to reform the church, I've come to realize in our time spent here, though I've known him before, there are two things that really resonate and I think excites him. And tell me if I get this right. He loves the local church, and certainly his family and the Lord, but he loves the local church. And his commitment to the local church is evident in terms of his passion and his desire to serve them well. But he also loves the global church, and he has been engaged from the beginning in terms of serving especially the unreached groups through ministries like Radius, but also teaching and writing along the way. The local and global church really resonate with us as well as we desire to serve the Lord well. And we're delighted that Chad is joining us today. So Pastor Chad, come up and teach us this morning on the topic of the commitments necessary to reform the church. Let's welcome him. Thank you, it's a privilege to be here. I was thinking yesterday as I stood here that this pulpit was probably built for the Shire so that hobbits, <laughs> hobbits could have a worship service. The, um, if you will, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. We're gonna return to the passage that we began looking at yesterday and, and continue to look at. I know there are some uh, guests here for seminary uh, was it called Seminary for a Day? Is that what you guys call the program? Yes. Yep, great. Um, I'm glad to have you. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to um, stick with us. It should be easy enough, though you missed yesterday. 2 Corinthians 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 and then pray. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. 
In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would, by your spirit, cause us to hear Christ, our Lord and Savior, to hear him as he speaks to us in his word, as he informs, teaches his church, not only as he taught the church at Corinth through superintending the writing of this by the hand of Paul, but as he teaches the church in every age. We pray that we would be be men who have been with Christ, that he would be present even now by the Spirit through the Word as your minister preaches it. Cause us to be men who are happy to make an open statement of the truth and who trust in the power of God to save through that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Sovereign Grace, uh, the church that I pastor, that I had the privilege of planting, has been a church in Reformation really for her whole life as a church. We've been working out the implications of our confessed doctrine in our understanding of worship over the years. And, And the working of that out really came up in four major areas. First, confidence in the preached word. I actually remember when we began to plant Sovereign Grace, I decided that we would meet with a church growth expert. Um, His name was Bob Brady. He is now with the Lord. But he he had been a church growth expert in the 70s and 80s. He had trained down at, at Fuller or up from here, Bakersfield down, up from here, Fuller Theological Seminary. Um, he, he did all the church growth surveys and met with churches to talk about principles of how to grow the church. And I thought, well, it would be fascinating to meet with him as we go to plant a church. And so as we met with Bob, um, I had been aware of a change in his life as we went into that meeting. We had lunch at his house, and he began to tell me, well, you know, um, I've been studying the word over the years. I've become reformed in my understanding, and I've repented of my church growth um, methods. In fact, um, it's not just I've become enlightened. Aren't I enlightened? I've repented of what I did. In fact, I sent a packet of information to every church with a letter to every church I consulted um, with a letter uh, confessing my sin, asking for their forgiveness, and offering to come and help them uh, rework all the mess I made so that they have a biblical ecclesiology. Um, So I sat with him and I wanted to ask about this. I'm going to plant a church. I was actually a minister of the evangelical megachurch that he had consulted um, to become a megachurch. And so I wanted to sit with him and I remember him telling me about when they were going out and surveying the various churches. One of the churches they surveyed that was growing really rapidly in the 70s and 80s was the church of John MacArthur, Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. It was growing by leaps and bounds. And so he said, we went to John MacArthur's staff meeting and we were sitting with John and I asked him, how do you explain the growth of your church? And he said, he looked across the table and his first statement was, well, it isn't the punch and cookies. I said, okay, um, but how do you explain it? And he said, John MacArthur looked at me and pounded the table three times and said, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. And Bob said, I said to myself at that point, Oh, he's completely naive. He has no idea how this church has grown. And I left. Since then, Bob said, I've reconsidered since I've studied the Bible. And I've, I've come to the considered opinion, Chad, that the one thing I would tell you to do as a church planter is preach the word. That's what you should be committed to. So that resonated with us. We heard that and said, okay, we will be committed to that because it's biblical and it's right And we were sort of bolstered in that. The other thing that we had a kind of confidence in 
initially and that we begin to grow in is our confidence in biblical worship. So in preaching of the word and in biblical worship, uh, we knew that the worship that we participated in was somewhat vacuous. We weren't entirely certain why it was vacuous, but we knew it probably was. And so um, my co-planter, a guy named Jason Faber, um, he said, let's read this book by Michael Horton called A Better Way. And so we, we read that book, and, and I remember being shocked by um, the notion of a, a sort of gospel-shaped liturgy. Here are the things that the Lord requires in worship. It's clear in the Bible. Let's do those things, and let's, let's kind of shape them in the sense of around the gospel message. And I thought that was compelling. We should do that. We even decided to participate in, in weekly communion. Now, there was a lot for us still to work out because we tried to put sort of pop evangelical songs into that order and, and do a lot of other things. It was just, it was a mess. But we went forward. The biggest problem, however, that we had with that was one Sunday, I'm preaching because we decided to do weekly communion. I'm preaching and I'm up front and, and as I'm preaching, I'm wondering why the whole congregation is not bothering to look at me. Now, I mean, sometimes people fall asleep or you know, wander off, and these things happen. But this time, every member of the congregation was looking at the communion tables. And I thought, what is happening here that this is occurring? And so I look around the pulpit and look down and notice there are rats eating the elements and drinking the elements. Rats at the communion table. One, one of the things that Horton didn't say is, if your co-planter is a Dutchman and he tells you that the lids for the elements are just too expensive, let's pass on those, <laughs> don't listen to him. <laughs> Buy the lids. So we went ahead and bought the lids. Those things are very expensive, by the way. We were also working out um, during this time uh, the issue of the baptism of covenant children. Now, Jason Faber, my co-planner, always believed in the baptism of covenant children, but we wrestled with that for years. Our elders decided that would be our direction as a church in um, August of 2022. So just, just over a year and a half ago, about a year and a half ago. Um, our elders had all come to that conclusion together um, over the years. I was actually the last one um, among us to come to that conclusion. And after we came to the conclusion, we wrestled with how we would approach it. My suggestion was, let's just kick the can down the road. Things are going swimmingly in the church. I think it would be better to postpone this. It's going to disrupt all that the Lord is doing. Um, that was mostly born out of fears that were somewhat unnecessary but understandable. And um, the elders looked at Jason and I and said, you guys made the mess. You guys are going to clean it up. And so we said, okay. Um, I deeply respected them for that. And it, it actually gave me a kind of courage when I announced this to the congregation. Now, there's, there's so much more to share. But by God's grace, the church has largely fared incredibly well through our Reformation. We have, we have been a church, if you will, in Reformation for 17 years. And our congregation understands that. They've kind of gone along this road with us. And what do I want to address this morning is that our Reformation was grounded in a set of necessary commitments. In fact, two necessary commitments that really grounded this Reformation as we walked through it. And I want to speak to those two commitments that are necessary to reforming the church. First, the commitment to repudiate fleshly methods. What you might call constituted means or new measures. I'll deal with that. Second, the commitment to embrace the ordinary means of grace. The ordinary means of grace, the preaching of the word, the bap baptism of believers and their children, the administration of the Lord's Supper, etc. So I want to consider first our, first our first commitment. Reformation requires the commitment to renouncing, refusing, repudiating worldly or fleshly means. And in order to ground this point, let me begin with the verse that we looked at yesterday, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. 
Therefore, having this ministry, what is this ministry? I addressed that yesterday. This is a reference back to new covenant ministry in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, 8. The ministry of justification or righteousness, 2 Corinthians 3, 9. The ministry of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which he's going to go on to address in verses 4 and 5. The ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. In other words, these are men whose ministry it is to proclaim the person and work of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why Paul, say, Paul says, I preach Christ and him crucified. It's not that we preach reconciliation or justification or forgiveness of sins. It's that we proclaim Christ in whom we have forgiveness of sins and justification and reconciliation with God. Him we proclaim. That's our ministry. We preach Christ in all of Scripture. That's why I love that description even of these lectures. That it's not just men who are academically well-equipped, but men who've been with Jesus. Those of us who know him, we preach him. We proclaim Christ in all of Scripture. To quote Charles Spurgeon, a sermon without Christ as its beginning, middle, and end is a mistaken conception and a crime in execution. That's how I would sum up my first several years of preaching, a mistaken conception and a crime in execution. We do this work of preaching by the appointment and power of the Holy Spirit and by proclaiming the Holy Spirit-inspired word that's been given to us. That's what we do. Apart from the Spirit of Christ, our words would fall to the ground. They would not go into the heart's of men. It is the Holy Spirit who takes the word of God and speaks that into the hearts of men. But we struggle to trust that truth. We struggle to. So we begin to slide easily into trusting our own cleverness in ministry. Our own cleverness. And we must repudiate that. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.2. But we have renounced. Notice the contrast. We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. We renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. This could be translated shameful or secret. Given the contrast of the open statement of the truth, the emphasis on, is on these kind of secret machinations and maneuvers. That's how Hodge refers to them. Secret machinations and, and maneuvers. There are so-called ministers who participate in methods or means that are underhanded, clever, and dishonest. And Paul adds an application to it regarding his ministry. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. He will not do anything that is crafty, beguiling, dishonest, manipulative. This, by the way, word cunning is the same word that Paul later uses in 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I'm afraid, listen to this language, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and, devo and pure devotion to Christ. Paul will not attempt to cleverly outsmart God in his approach to ministry. Paul is saying that there is a kind of minister who participates in secret machinations that if they were brought into the light, he would be ashamed, and Paul refuses to do that. Rather, he's committed to fulfilling his ministry by an open statement of the truth. Paul's making a direct contrast between, if you will, the new measures and the ordinary means of grace. Now, what do I mean by new measures? I, I'm really stealing from language describing the work of Charles Finney. Charles Finney, 19th century preacher, believed that we could employ measures that could bring about conversion. I, I'm not just accusing him of, him of that. Listen to his own quote. I'll quote him from one of his writings. The evangelist, the evangelist must produce excitements sufficient to induce sinners to repentance. Did you know you could do that? You can produce excitements sufficient 
to induce sinners to repentance. I, I think those committed to new measures or church growth methods absolutely believe that Finney's correct here. They're fundamentally committed to the notion that we can induce excitements sufficient, um, or produce excitement, sorry, sufficient to induce, induce sinners to repentance. So let's get together in a staff meeting and let's figure out what those excitements are that we can produce to induce sinners to repentance. I've been in those staff meetings where we've discussed how we can attract more unbelievers. How we can cause more folks to engage from the heart if we just employ the right measures. One time we had a service in a tent and so we got everybody together. Our church was growing rapidly. We went from 700 to 2,000 in a week and then to 3,500 in a year. Um, we were growing rapidly. We had multiple services and we're like, well, um, we got us, ourselves all together in a big tent for one worship service together and then the guys talked about how we need to keep doing that because it caused a kind of electricity in the room that really got the work done. We went on pastoral retreats where we would read books beforehand on how the church grows and we would meet to discuss how to bring in more folks and we would plan clever tactics. We we rarely discussed our faithfulness to the clear teaching of the word. Rarely. We almost never discussed proper administration of the sacraments. And I can tell you, we never, never talked about how to exercise church discipline. In fact, um, I remember a year we went on a retreat and we were assigned to go out on the beach and pray. This is what we do. Go out to the beach, we pray, read your Bible, and ask the Lord to give you a vision for the future of the church. Come back. Ten years, we're going to be 5,000 people and we're going to have these buildings. You know, these kind of, that's what I mean by vision. So we go out and ask the Lord for a vision. And I was reading my Bible and I was praying. And one of the things we were also to come back with is, what does the Lord want to be our theme this year? What's our, how about Jesus Christ? Is that a good theme all, all the time, right? But no, what will be our theme for this year? We'll make banners, we'll produce a teaching series around it, we'll, we'll produce all kinds of excitements that will induce sinners to repentance. So what will it be? Well, I happened to be reading through 1 Corinthians, and I was reading through 1 Corinthians 5 that morning. And so I came to this, back to the meeting as we were talking about our vision for the year and our theme, and I said, how about our theme be expel the immoral brother? That would help deal with our church growth problems. In other words, I was beginning to come to the conclusion that this talk was bankrupt. Um, I was beginning to realize that the doctrine, I confess, did not match with the methods we employed. By the way, our staff also listened to R.C. Sproul, went to the Shepherds Conference, read books by Michael Horton, listened to the White Horse Inn. We saw zero, no disconnect between that theology and our practice. But by God's grace, I began to see that our cleverness in ministry, our creativeness in ministry is not neutral. Our techniques were not morally ambiguous. Rather, we were, as Paul says, emptying the cross of its power. Paul says there are techniques or methods I don't participate in because they empty the cross of its power. Can you imagine a more damning statement about your ministry than that? We were denying what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. Look there, verse 3. And even if our gospel's veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. We were denying um, this teaching that these people were blinded and they could not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ and we could not produce excitements sufficient to induce them to repentance. That we needed to make an open statement of the truth and trust the power of the Holy Spirit to work through the word of God to change people. We were denying the power of God and the gospel word. 
We were undermining the work of the Holy Spirit. In other words, here's what I'm trying to get at. Creative ministry methods is just another phrase for pastoral unbelief. Clever methods are a clear indicator that I do not believe in the present and active ministry of the Holy Spirit through his word. It may be caused by ignorance due to being entrenched in worldly traditions, but it is biblically repugnant nonetheless. Allowing the worldly traditions or worldly traditions in the church growth movement to govern your ministry methods is no different than allowing the serpent to whisper in your wife's ear. It's subjecting Christ's bride to the cunning of Satan. It's often motivated by the desire to preach ourselves. See, to preach ourselves is to preach with the goal of attracting the admiration and accolades of men. We want to be sought after, loved, highly regarded, spoken well of. So I want to ask pastors or seminary students, what is your goal in preaching? What is your goal? Do you desire to hear, that's the greatest sermon I've ever heard, or that man is the greatest preacher I've ever heard? Or do you desire to hear, that preacher has the greatest God of whom I've ever heard? That is the greatest gospel of grace I've ever heard proclaimed. I've often forgotten and sometimes still forget that I'm merely a bond slave of Christ, an ambassador of the king, and I have no right to come up with ministry methods he hasn't given in scripture. My fear, though, is that too many pastors and seminary students believe that this ministry we participate in relies on their powers of persuasion, their creative methods, their sufficiency. When Paul says... Who is sufficient for these things? The answer ought to be, I am not. Not me and not anyone I know, but the church growth movement is a movement that responds, we are. Read our books, come to our conferences, do what we give you to do. Their fundamental commitment is that we can build a model that will remove the irrationality of the eyes of the blind and the unbelief from the hearts of the spiritually dead. This is, by the way, the fundamental bankruptcy of all who do not know reform ministry. It's driven by, if you will, to borrow a phrase from R.C. Sproul, the Pelagian captivity of the church. Somewhere along the line, the evangelical church climbed the dunghill of history picked up the Pelagian idol of libertarian free will, brushed it off, and bowed down and worshipped it. If we're to reform the church in accord with our confessional standards, then we must be committed, committed to renouncing any means or methods that are born from the secret machinations of our own hearts. And that leads to our second commitment. Reformation requires the commitment to being a servant of the word. What is Paul's stated method of ministry? Look at 2 Corinthians 4.2. He will just tell you his method of ministry in 4.2. But, middle phrase, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Look at chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians and verse 17. For we are not... Like so many, peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. His his method is the clear teaching of God's word, as a man of sincerity, not as a cunning, clever man. What is Paul's fundamental conviction about why men do not believe? Because the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And how is that problem resolved? 2 Corinthians 4, 5. For what we proclaim, here's his method again, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, the Holy Spirit regenerates the hearts of men as the word is openly and plainly Proclaimed. 
Paul understands that he is merely a humble vessel whom God uses, that the power of ministry belongs to the Lord. That's why he says, verse 7, but we have this treasure, this gospel ministry, this proclamation, this message about Jesus Christ, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Now, without laying out a whole case for word and sacraments, I just want to state that these are the means of grace, and they're both, if you will, a ministry of the word. In preaching the gospel, we proclaim the word to the hearer. In the sacraments, we show the gospel to the hearer or to the seer in signs and seals of God's promises. I tell our congregation all the time, especially come out of evangelicalism, looking for visuals. What are the visuals in our worship service? Well, the Lord provided them. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Don't you want to come up with anything creative? No. The only people in church history that come up with creative things we call heretics. I don't want to be one. Right? So I would prefer not to participate in that. Neither should you. God has given us what we need to do. Do we believe that? Do we believe that these are the means through which God's spirit powerfully works? Do we believe that the Lord's given means are sufficient to the task of ministry? Do we believe that? If we do, then it shows up in our ministry. I know many of our folks doubt this. I know it. If you're a pastor, you're going to find out a lot of people in your church doubt this. You're constantly having to remind them of this. And while you're reminding them of this as they clamor, you're having to remind yourself of it because you're afraid if you don't cave in to some of the pressures as they clamor for it, that they'll leave. They're convinced, your people come to you convinced that if you just made the right changes to the church, then the young people would come. And their unbelieving friends would flock. You just made the right changes. As an aside, maybe your church does need some circumstantial changes, but the elements must remain the same. You know, there's no virtue in participating in circumstances that are culturally incoherent to your people, nor to those, if you will, outside your door. But please do not misunderstand. I am not denying that the church must be countercultural in a number of ways. Uh, for example, sermons are not TED Talks, right? They're not. So I think it would be prudential to signal something countercultural in dressing like an adult when you preach in placing a pulpit in front of you and standing there preaching the word rather than rolling up your sleeves like an adolescent and sitting on a stool and participating in a dialogue because you've just communicated to a whole culture of people that you have no real authority. That's not how we cue taking authority in our culture. But you need to be intentional about that. I've had objections from reform folks about our worship service because we use a guitar and a cajon in worship. I know. We do. We do because um, they, their objection is you're not using a piano or an organ. Look, we've been, my church has been in 14 locations in 17 years. We have zero buildings we own. We use one location in the morning, one in the evening, one for our classical school during the week, and one for our offices and other trainings. We... Um, even if we wanted to use a piano, there's no way we're going to cart it in and out of all of those places each week. We used to have a whole drum set. We decided we wanted to eliminate it because we were convicted that you needed to be able to hear the congregation when you sing, and the, <laughs> and the drums were sort of drowning that, pro that out. And so we thought, we should get rid of the, the drum set. Um, but we didn't actually have to do it because one night our trailer was broken into, our drums were stolen. I stood up in front of the congregation and said, in the Lord's providence, he's decided we will no longer have drums. It was easy. God was gracious to us in that way. But, but in all seriousness, if you think we're a little use, loose for using a guitar, then I would point you to Dr. Clark. <laughs> and I would because he thinks you've already jumped the shark when you use any instruments at all. <laughs> All right, my point is merely, my point is merely that 
let us not bicker over circumstances, assuming we accept that instruments are circumstances. And Dr. Clark's pastor does to his great chagrin. So, <laughs> let us go to battle over the elements that God requires, that he prescribes in his word. The overall point I'm making is that you and your members may struggle to trust in what we call the regulative principle of worship. They may struggle to trust it. One of our problems, though, is that we do things like having our children run off to Christian schools and colleges where they rock out with the latest Christian music uh, with their bands and where they gain an appetite for evangelical emotionalism and then they come back clamoring for it and their parents start clamoring for us to change lest we lose their children. Perhaps there's a better way than caving into all that. Maybe we should teach our people, regularly show them why our elements are biblically required, why they're sufficient to the task. Speak to the wisdom of why you ordered the worship service the way you do. Explain to them the gospel and how we want the worship service to be shaped that way. Explain to them why we do not want to put any words that are beneath our Lord into his mouth when we preach or sing or pray. Explain to them that this only dishonors our holy God and this does not prepare our people for the sufferings of this present life. I'll remember when we began to learn this at our own church. Uh, we had a family um, with um, 11 children. It was one of these homeschool families, gloriously godly members of our church, um, they're still a part of our church. But their 11th child, a, a little girl named Quinlan, died in the hospital at her birth. And the whole family was present. And, and like a good homeschool family, they could all sing like a choir. right? And so we, we uh, went to the hospital. I'll never forget myself and Jason, another one of a, a guy who we was an intern at the time. We showed up at the hospital, the maternity wing there where... Um, the babies were being born and it was silent, somber. That's what happens in this, kind of, in this part of the hospital when a baby dies at birth. And we walked into the room and there they're holding Quinlan um, and they're crying. And you know, as a minister, you're at a loss for what you do. I'm just gonna read a psalm, I'm gonna pray. And then I said to them, what, is there anything else you would like us to do while we're here? Yeah, we wanna sing. We want to sing. And then they came out with some very rich hymns that they sang, and we all sang together, and the music of their singing filled that whole wing of the hospital. Everybody was moved. I mean, it was hard to keep it together. And I remember that Sunday, I walked into our pulpit at our church, talked to the elders about it. I walked into our pulpit at our church, and I told our congregation, no more are we going to sing these popular Christian radio songs because none of them, none of them are sufficient in what they teach and what you're now learning, memorizing, singing to bear the weight of your souls when you're in the hospital with your dead child. Not one. So we won't sing any songs that can't walk us through all the, if you will, ups and downs of life. That's why God wrote the Psalter the way he did, with lament and with praise. Let me dispel one major myth. None of these evangelical seeker-sensitive measures actually means anything to unbelievers. Do you know that? In fact, they're largely designed to appeal to church-going baby boomers. Not really unbelievers. I was, um, I've been filming a series of, of uh, documentaries on missionaries, and so I've been flying around the world, and I'm flying so much... Um, that I often, almost always, get automatically upgraded to first class. That's nice, but I don't want to fly that much anymore. <laughs> so, but here I am, so I get upgraded to first class. I'm sitting on a flight from LA to Newark next to a um, movie star. I won't name the person. It's a person who's both been in films and TV and directed and written, produced major motion pictures. So we're sitting there, and I engage him, and we start to talk about Christianity. Of course, I'm going to take the opportunity. He looked at me, smiled. I thought he wants to hear the gospel. So here, here we go. 
So <laughs> that's, the, that's the smile. So we started talking about Christianity and what we believe. Um, he had grown up marginally Roman Catholic um, on the northeast part of the country and uh, had some familiarity with Christianity. I started walking him through our general claims. There's a God who created everything. He is the only God. We rebelled against him. We're sinners. He promised to send his son to keep the law we failed to keep, to pay the penalty for our law breaking at the cross, to raise from the dead um, so that we would be saved through faith in him. And so I walk him through this, and we're talking, and he says, this is very interesting. And then I said, have you ever been to a Christian worship service? And he said, not a Protestant one. And I said, let me ask you a question. I'm just curious. Um, would you be interested in coming to one? Nope. Okay. How about if I had a rocking band, fog machines, robotic lighting? What if I dressed more hip? It was more casual. You could come in, you get a latte. Would you come then? No. And he says to me, do you really think that the reason unbelievers like me don't come to your worship service is because it's not entertaining enough? Or that if you made it more entertaining, we would come? It's not that. It's, that, it's what you teach. You teach that there's a God and that you can learn about him in this book and that I'm a sinner going to hell and there's a, that God became man and walked among us and saved me. That is nuts. That's why I don't come to your church. Not because it's not entertaining enough. Brothers, Paul has told us that the gospel is foolishness to the Gentiles. You can't dress up a fool and make him seem wise. Unbelievers are blinded in their unbelief. Our creative techniques are not going to change any of that. We cannot give life to dead hearts. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. Brothers, I am not, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God. That's why Paul is eager to preach it. We do not find ways to make the message or the messenger appealing. We do not try to build institutions, preaching ministries, etc., in an effort to convince men of our winsomeness, intellect, powers of persuasion, or otherwise. We hold forth the word clearly in all its visible weakness and spiritual power. We are servants of the word, preached orally and seen visibly in the sacraments. We patiently teach and exhort. We watch our doctrine and our lives closely. We handle the word of truth with care. We rebuke those who contradict. We feed the sheep. By an open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone. May the Lord be pleased to use the means he has given to the salvation of many and to the building up of his church. May the Lord give us the conviction that his work through his given means is necessary and sufficient to transform hearts and reform his church. Let me pray. Father, we ask that you would cause us to trust that your son, the head of the church, has sent his spirit and that the spirit of Christ is powerfully presently, actively at work among us to save men and women and children through the, the means that he has given to us that have been prescribed in his word. May we lean into the fact that we are weak, humble vessels and that the surpassing power of ministry belongs to God and not to us. And may we make an open statement of the truth and renounce any clever, creative means, trusting the means that Christ, the head of the church, has given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Chad, um, 
thank you for your faithful exposition and your challenge and the ways that you have stretched us. Um, despite the quip about shorter people, um, we're grateful uh, for, for your presence here and teaching as well. I recognize that much of what we've discussed and are hearing, I'm sure it's percolating in your mind and, and as you think about these things, you have yet one more opportunity to uh, interact and learn from a seasoned pastor this afternoon at two o'clock uh, in the student lounge, am I right? Room four, sorry, room four. You'd be gathered together to uh, discuss with him about the various things he talked about, perhaps as you think about and pray about where the Lord is leading you as well. And especially for those who are joining us for seminary for a day, we're delighted that you're here. I hope that what you've heard here, as well as what you will hear throughout the classes, uh, you remember the centrality of the church and the name of Christ Jesus. I think this is what we try to emulate as well as share with everyone who's here. And we're so glad Pastor Chad joining us to reemphasize that for us as well. As we end, let's all turn to Psalm 100B. Uh, that'll be our final song, all four verses. Let's rise to sing together, shall we? 100B. Please join us for Refreshments Out Back. 